here a few feet from where we're standing, in the very same old Vagwami Railroad coach where the armistice was signed on that chilly morning of November 11, 1918, negotiations for another armistice, the one to end the present war between France and Germany, began at 3.30 p.m. German summer time this afternoon. What a turning back of the clock, what a reversing of history we've been watching here in this beautiful Compiègne forest this afternoon. What a contrast to that game of 22 years ago. Yes, even the weather, for we've had one of those lovely warm June days, which you get in this part of France, close to Paris, about this time of year. As we stood here watching Adolf Hitler and Field Marshal Goering and the other German leaders laying down the terms of armistice, to the French plenipotentiaries here this afternoon, it was difficult to comprehend that in this rustic little clearing in the midst of the forest of Compiègne, from where we're talking to you now, an armistice was signed here on a cold gray morning at 5 a.m. on November 11, 1918. The railroad coach, it was Marshal Foch's private car, stands a few feet away from us here at exactly the same spot where it stood on that gray morning 22 years ago. Only, and what an only it is, too, Adolf Hitler sat in the seat occupied that day by Marshal Foch. Hitler, who at that time, was only an unknown corporal in the German army. And in that quaint, old, wartime, vagrant car, another armistice is being drawn up as I speak to you now. An armistice designed like the other that was signed on this spot to bring armed hostilities to a halt between those ancient enemies, Germany and France. Only everything, everything that we've been seeing here this afternoon in Compiègne Forest has been so reversed. The last time, the representatives of France sat in that car dictating the terms of the armistice. This afternoon, we peered through the windows of the car and saw Adolf Hitler laying down the terms. Thus does uh, history reverse itself, but seldom has it done so as today on, on the very same spot. The German leader in the preamble of the conditions which were read to the French delegates by Colonel General von Keitel, chief of the German Supreme Command, told the French that he had not chosen this spot at Compiègne out of revenge, but merely to right an old wrong. The armistice negotiations here on the same spot where the last armistice was signed in 1918, here in Compiègne Forest, began at 3.15 p.m., our time. A warm June sun beat down on the great elm and pine trees and cast pleasant shadows on the wooded avenues as Herr Hitler, with the German plenipotentiaries at his side, appeared. He lighted from his car in front of the French monument to Alsace Lorraine, which stands at the end of an avenue about 200 yards from the clearing here in front of us where the armistice car stands. That famous Alsace Lorraine statue was covered with German war flags, so that you could not see its sculptured work nor read its inscription. But I've seen it many times in the post-war years, and doubtless many of you have seen it. A large sword representing the sword of the Allies, and its coin sticking into a large limp eagle representing the old empire of the Kaiser. And the inscription underneath in front saying, To the heroic soldiers of France, defenders of the country and of right, Glorious liberators of Alsace-Lorraine. Through our glasses, we saw the fur stop, glance at the statue, observe the right war flags with their big swastikas in the center. Then he strode slowly toward us, toward the little clearing where the famous armistice car stood. I thought he looked very solemn, his face was gray, but there was a certain spring in his step as he walked for the first time towards the spot where Germany's fate was sealed on that November day of 1918, a fate which, by reason of his own deeds, is now being radically changed here on this spot. And now, if I may sort of go over my notes I made from moment to moment this afternoon, now Hitler reaches a little opening in the Compiègne woods where the armistice was signed and where another is about to be drawn up. He pauses and slowly looks around. The opening here is in the form of a circle about 200 yards in diameter, and laid out like a park. Cypress trees line it all around, and behind them the great elms and oaks of the forest. This has been one of France's national shrines for 22 years. Hitler pauses, 
and gazes slowly around. In a group just behind him are the other German plenipotentiary. Field Marshal Goering, grasping his Field Marshal's baton in one hand, he wears the blue uniform of the Air Force. All the Germans are in uniform. Hitler in a double-breasted gray uniform with the Iron Cross hanging from his left breast pocket. Next to Goering are the two German army chiefs, Colonel General von Kaipu, Chief of the Supreme Command, and Colonel General von Bauchert, Commander-in-Chief of the German Army. Both are just approaching 60, but look younger, especially General von Keitel, who has a dapper appearance with his cap slightly cocked on one side. Then we see there Dr. Rader, Grand Admiral of the German fleet. He has on a blue naval uniform and the invariable upturned stiff collar which German naval officers usually wear. We see two non-military men in Hitler's fleet. There's Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop in the field gray uniform of the Foreign Office, and Rudolf Hess, Hitler's deputy, in a gray party uniform. The time is now, I see by my notes, 3.18 p.m. on the forest of Compiègne. Hitler's personal standard is run up on a small post in the center of the circular opening in the wood. Also in the center is a great granite block which stands some three feet above the ground. Hitler, followed by the others, walks slowly over to it, steps up, and reads the inscription engraved in great high letters on that block. Many of you will remember the words of that inscription. The first slowly reads them, and the inscription says, Here, on the 11th of November, 1918, to come the criminal pride of the German Empire, vanquished by the free peoples which it tried to enslave. Hitler reads it, and Goering reads it. They all read it, standing there in the June sun and the silence. We look for the expression on Hitler's face, but it, it does not change. Finally, he leads his party over to another granite stone, a smaller one some 50 yards to one side. Here it was at the railroad car in which the German plenipotentiary stayed during the 1918 armistice negotiations stood from November 8th to 11th. Hitler looks down and reads the inscription which merely says, the German plenipotentiary. The stone itself, I notice, is set between a pair of rusty old railroad tracks, the very ones that were there 22 years ago. It is now 3.23 p.m., and the German leader stride over to the armistice car. This car, of course, was not standing on this spot yesterday. It was standing 75 yards down the rusty track in the shelter of a tiny museum built to house it by an American citizen, Mr. Arthur Henry Fleming of Pasadena, Pasadena California. Yesterday, the car was removed from the museum by German army engineers and rolled back those 75 yards to the spot where it stood on the morning of November 11, 1918. The Germans stand outside the car, chatting in the sunlight. This goes on for two minutes. Then Hitler steps up into the car, followed by Goering and the others. We watch them entering the drawing room in Marshal Foch's car. We can see nicely now through the car windows. Hitler enters first and takes the place occupied by Marshal Foch the morning the first armistice was signed. At his side are Goering and General Keitel. To his right and left, at the ends of the table, we see General von Bochitz and Herr Hoff. At the one end, at the other end, Grand Admiral Rader and Herr von Ribbentrop. The opposite side of the table is still empty, and we see there how they can share. The French have not yet appeared, but we do not wait long. Exactly at 3.30 p.m., the French alight from a car. They have flown up from Bordeaux to a nearby landing field and then driven here in auto. They glanced at the Alsace Lorraine Memorial, now draped with swastikas, but it's a swift glance. Then they walk down the avenue, flanked by three German army officers. We see them now as they come into the sunlight of the clearing. General Huntinger, wearing a brief khaki uniform, Air General Bergeret, and Vice Admiral Leluc both in their respective dark blue uniforms. And then, almost buried in the uniforms, the one single civilian of the day, Mr. Noel, French ambassador to Poland, on a present war broke out for us. The French plenipotentiaries passed the guard of honor, 
drawn up at the entrance to the quarry. The guard snaps to attention for the French, but does not present arms. The Frenchmen keep their eyes straight ahead. It's a grave hour in the life of France. And their faces are burning, show the burden they feel on their shoulders. Their faces are solemn, drawn, but they're the picture of tragic dignity. They walk stiffly to the car where they're met by two German officers, Lieutenant Colonel Tipple's care, Quartermaster General, and Colonel Thomas, Chief of the Ferris Headquarters. The German salute, the French salute. The atmosphere is what Europeans call correct. But you get the picture when I say that we see no handshakes, not on occasions like this. The historic moment is now approaching. It is 3.32 by my watch. The Frenchman enter Marshal Foch's Pullman car, standing there a few feet from us in Compiègne Forest. Now we get our picture through the dusty windows of that historic old wagon lee car. Hitler and the other German leaders rise from their feet as the French enter the drawing room. Hitler, we see, gives the Nazi salute, the arm raised. The German officers give a military salute. The French do the same. I cannot see Mr. Noel to see whether he salutes or how. Hitler, so far as we can see through the windows just in front of us here, does not say anything. He nods to General Keitel at his side. We can see General Keitel adjusting his paper, and then he starts to read. He is reading the preamble of the German armistice term. The French sit there with marble-like faces and listen intently. Hitler and Goering glance at the green tabletop. This part of the historic act lasts but a few moments. I note in my notebook here this. 3.42 p.m., that is 12 minutes after the French arrived. 3.42, we see Hitler stand up, salute stiffly with hand up raised. Then he slides out of the Goering room, followed by Goering, General Braukitsch, Grand Admiral Rader is there, Herr Hess, and at the end, Herr von Levenso. The French remain at the green top table in the old Pullman car, and we see General Keitel remains with them. He is going to read them the detailed conditions of the armistice. Hitler, Goering, and the others do not wait for this. They walk down the avenue back towards the Alsace Lorraine Monument. As they pass the Guard of Honor, a German band strikes up the two national anthems, Deutschland über Alles, and the Horst Vessel song. The whole thing has taken but a quarter of an hour, this great reversal of a historical act. Well, now, here is William C. Kircher of NBC. We've been working together on this joint broadcast for CBS and NBC. Your speaker thus far has been William L. Shire of Columbia. And I'm now going to turn you over to Bill Kircher, who will tell you what went on inside that car on this historic day of June 21st, 1940, in Compiègne Forest, where the new armistice is now being worked out. Take it over, Bill Kircher. Thank you, Bill. Hello, CBS. Hello, NBC. This is William C. Kircher now carrying on. We are still waiting for those exact terms, but we have only the following on hand. It is the preamble which Colonel General von Geitel read to the French plenipotentiaries after Hitler spoke these few words, which were the only ones he uttered during the time he sat facing the French delegates. Quote, General Oris von Keitel now has the word, unquote. Von Keitel rose, faced the French gentlemen, and opened his address to them by saying, quote, in confidence to President Wilson's terms, giving securities for an honorable peace, November 11th, 1918, the German army laid down its arms, unquote referring to the, quote, inaudible terms of enforced upon Germany, unquote, and the ensuing consequences, when title continued to read, quote, now France has been conquered. After a series of continuous bloody battles, France has collapsed, unquote. During this time, Mr. William O'Shire and I stood barely 50 feet away from the car, which had been placed exactly on the very same spot it had stood in 1918. We could see that Hitler and Gang had their faces turned towards von Keitel, apparently following his words with great attention. Occasionally a banner would roll, would go overhead, or a bird would chirp lustily, quite unheedful of the solemn occasion which was taking place. Foreign as well as German correspondents were stretching their necks to try and get a, get a glimpse of what was happening in that car. All I could see is that von Keitel 
was still reading while his attendant stood behind him. He continued to say, quote, the fact that the armistice is to be signed at Compiègne is not to be understood as an act of revenge, unquote. Moreover, he assured the French plenipotentiaries, which by now were, were seating, sitting in the very same seats which the Germans had in 1918, uh, he assured them, quote, neither the negotiations nor the conditions of capitulation will contain a note of insult or calumnity. And although these negotiations take place in the forest of Compiègne, then it is only to repair an injustice and not to insult the representatives of the people which have fought so bravely, unquote. I might mention again that Borshara has already told you that Hitler himself was the first one to rise as soon as the French plenipotentiaries entered the dining car. By the by, the number of that car is number D-2604. And as soon as Adolf Hitler stood up to greet the French delegates by giving the Nazi salute, Herr von Ribbentrop and Rudolf Hess followed suit, while Field Marshal Goering and Grand Admiral von Raider raised their baton, leaving Colonel General von Brauchitsch and von Keitel as the only ones to give the military salute. The French gentlemen themselves, in turn, greeted with a military salute, and all those present wore uniforms, except Monsieur Noel, who was attired in smart civilian clothes. He himself was quite a contrast to the glittering uniforms which surrounded him. However, undeterredly, he took his place, almost facing Herr Hitler, who was sitting at the opposite side of that long green table with his back towards the statue of General Foch. The introductions of the French plenipotentiaries to the German representatives were made by Lieutenant Colonel Tippenkirk. The whole thing lasted only about 30 seconds, and then Hitler motioned to Colonel General von Keitel to start reading the preamble. I've given you the first part of that address. It does not contain any direct information as to terms by which Hitler will accept the capitulation of the French army. However, it does give us a hint as to the basis of negotiations which are still continuing. These three sentences, which I shall just give to, give to you in just a moment, were read to the French delegates from the preamble, as of which I understood, was prepared by Hitler himself. It seemed to me as if von Kertel took special pains to address the French delegates personally. As he said, quote, the general basis of these negotiations is to be to prevent resumption of the present fighting. Secondly, to offer Germany all securities for her continuation of the war against England. Furthermore, thirdly, to create the presupposition for the planning of a new peace, the contents of which is to be the reparation of an injustice inflicted upon Germany by force, unquote. Well, that is all we know at the moment. I have rushed this translation to you as quickly as possible, and as you may notice, of course, it does not tell us anything in particular. Those exact terms have not been officially made known. As a matter of fact, the actual conditions under which Germany will accept capitulation of the French army and of France itself were made known to the French plenipotentiaries after Hitler left the car. However, before he got up to salute the French delegates, there was a moment during which something occurred which even until now has remained unclear to all of us here who have been right at the spot with a grandstand seat, so to speak. It appeared as if Hitler was reading some sort of declaration. At any rate, Goering was peering over his shoulder, and it looked as if he was trying to get a glimpse of what Hitler was reading off. Anyway, it lasted for about two minutes. To be exact, from 3.40 to 3.42. Whether something of great importance happened, we cannot say. However, I've been told that Hitler did not read any sort of declaration at that time or that time at all. Perhaps... He just followed a copy of the preamble. From what I get, Colonel General von Keitel was the only one who did any talking whatsoever during the whole time. As a matter of fact, he is the only German official of Hitler's entourage who remained in the car after Hitler himself left. Bill Schara has already told you how Hitler stepped out of the car and retraced his steps past the Guard of Honor. Just that moment, the band played the national anthem Deutschland die Rollers, which, on this occasion, too, was followed up by the second national anthem, the old party song, the old horse vessel song. 
the commanding officer of the Guard of Honor stepped up to Hitler and said, quote, My Führer, the German army greets you, unquote. As Hitler left to return to his own car, which was waiting near the Alsace Lorraine monument, now draped with the German war flag, the French delegates continued to stand until he actually got into his car. It was not until Field Marshal Goering led the accompanying general staff officers and all those hundreds of soldiers who waited to see Hitler in a rousing cheer that the French delegates took their seats. As I've said before, and try to remain with them and hand them the German terms in French. At exactly 4.26, the plenipotentiaries left the car to walk over to a small tent which had been set up for them. Here, they had a chance to discuss the conditions of capitulation among themselves. It is not a fancy tent they got, but at any rate, it had a table, four chairs, and a sealed war stand. They also had their own telephone line to Bordeaux so as to be able to confer with the heads of the French government. Apparently, the Germans, that is to say, von Keitel and his accident remained in the car after the Frenchmen had left. It was not until later that I saw von Keitel step out and take a walk into the nearby woods. Meanwhile, discussion among foreign correspondents have been pretty heated as to what ter- sort of terms the Frenchmen got. We still do not know anything, and in all likelihood, it will not be until late tonight that some sort of conclusive information will be handed out. We had plenty of time to run over our notes and to give you the first-hand description of what actually took place. Bill Shira is still looking around, trying to get something or to find out a little more. Well, it was 21 years and eight months ago that Compagnie was the scene of the signing of an armistice. And today, we are right here on the very same spot. It is the same car which was used that time, the same table, the same chairs. Only this time, everything is reversed. Where Marshal Foch sat that time, now Hitler sat. Where the German delegates had their place, now the French plenipotentiaries are seated. Everything is reversed. Then it was Germany who was asking for an armistice, and now it is France who is stating our bid for an armistice to German military officials. We are in the midst of a hurricane of events which have been unleashed by Hitler with a kind of furious prodigality and unconcern for world opinion. Barely six weeks ago, he let loose with the biggest show in his career. And in this short span of time, the clock of history has been set back almost a quarter of a century. And today, we have witnessed the reversal of time. Apparently, no new developments have come about. Bill is motioning to me, telling me there is nothing new at the moment. The sun is beginning to set. It is getting a bit windy. German officers are still standing about looking at that car. Well, NBC and CBS, for the time being, I believe, there will be little news coming from here. We'll have to wait until the official communique upon this meeting between Hitler and the German generals and French plenipotentiaries has been issued. Hello, America. This has been a joint broadcast of the Columbia Broadcasting System and the National Broadcasting Company. Your commentators were William L. Shire for the CBS and William C. Curtis for the NBC. We have been talking to you from the forest of Compagnie, where the armistice of 1918 was signed, and where this afternoon, Adolf Hitler handed to the French plenipotentiaries the terms of the armistice, which he was willing to give France. Just a minute, Bill. I <clears throat> see now down there that uh, both delegations have just returned to Marshal Foch's car. Uh, the negotiations go on. They keep on talking, the Germans and, Fr- Germans and French, and they'll undoubtedly take some time. Uh, that's all I see out there for the moment. And William C. Kirker and William L. Shire return you now from the forest of Compiègne in France to America. You have just heard a special broadcast from the Compiègne Forest in France, where on the historic morning of November 11th, 1918, representatives of the German army received from the Allies the terms of the armistice which ended the First World War. And where today, June 21st, 1940, Representatives of the French government received from Führer Adolf Hitler the terms under which a cessation of hostilities between Germany and France may be reached. Speakers were William L. Shira, CBS correspondent, and William C. Kirchner of NBC. As you know, the actual terms presented to the French plenipotentiaries have not yet been made public.
We again wish to thank the makers of Calumet Baking Powder and Swan's Down Flour, sponsors of My Son and I, and the makers of Mazzola Salad and Cooking Oil, sponsors of Society Girl, for relinquishing their program periods, during which time we brought you the special European broadcast just concluded. This is the Columbia 